if I had a pound for every time I've posted, made a program or put social media about the Romans and building things, and I've had people replying what the Romans have done yeah, for us, yeah, I'd be yeah. a very wealthy man. Yes. I mean, that's well, good. I mean, that's um, that is, I'd that's, be a wealthy man. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, yeah I'd be you even be, wealthy. You came up with it. <laughs> yeah. If they find the endurance, uh, would that be some, would that be as exciting for you as these other as Erebus and Terra? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, Shackleton was one of the, the great sort of polar navigators, and his story is incredibly exciting, especially the rescue of the the, the, the crew from from South Georgia and all that. Uh, and also, uh, I think with Shackleton's ship, you would hopefully find information of him. Um, because, I mean, they kept a lot of records there. Whereas with Erebus and Terra, people worried that, that the Inuit would have gone on board ship and they weren't interested in the paper at all. They were really interested in supplies and all that. would have just thrown it all away. But then endurance would not have been interfered with because it's much, much uh, deeper. As someone who's travelled extensively in the polar regions, what advice do you have for us that are going down to the cold? <laughs> Take a jumper. Uh, the, the great thing now is is that equipment is so lightweight and and well made that you can move around very very easily. And it's kind of as long as you get the right gear, you will be um, you'll be able to move far more easily than Shackleton and his men would have been at that time. Um, otherwise, I, I I don't know. I've always been quite lucky when I've been to the Arctic or the Antarctic. I've never faced really, really severe weather. So I don't know the mental state they would need to be in if you got stuck in the ice, um, or if things went really, really wrong. Who would you like to be stuck in the ice with for an Antarctic or an Arctic winter? David Attenborough. <laughs> Who wouldn't? <laughs> Who wouldn't you like to be stuck in the ice, I should ask you first. <laughs> um, you mentioned things like lead pipes. Are there any other sort of conspiracy theories that, what's, what's not conspiracy theories are wrong? Is, are there any other theories that you find quite attractive to explain exactly what went wrong? What I would like to know more about is, the, is whether they communicated with the Inuit at any time. And you're on board this ship, it's not moving anywhere. It's easy to get off the ship. Inuits must have passed by, although it was a bleak island. Why didn't they, why weren't they able to talk to them? There is one um, instance which, which the Inuit recount where they did, and they talked, and the Inuit gave a few, a few of the men some fish, you know, what, that they'd caught. And then that was the end of it. It was like, you know, no one knew what else to say. The end, and they just went off, and the Inuit went off in the other direction. What I would want to know is what happened if the two actually could have talked to each other. There are stories, aren't there, that talk about sort of myths and things of, of people who might have survived, aren't there? The, the rumours that maybe... Oh, yes. The big ginger, survived. the big the big Inuit. The big, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. The yeah. yeah, yes. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I thought the uh, that... that Dan Simmons, was it he wrote the book? Yeah, wrote the book Terror, that's right. I mean, he obviously sort of had, he, he, he made this legendary creature that eventually did for them all a huge, monstrous polar bear, which others have said, well, that was what he was describing there was a state of mind and their mental state. And that, that's something which you can only speculate about. But I would imagine after that time, there must have been some real, real desperation. And I would love to know whether they, what kind of state of mind they were in when they left the ship. We ask everyone, what's the moment of history they wish they could have witnessed? And would you like to have seen the last few months of, of Erebus and Terra's life? I, I would like to have been in the Antarctic when they got further south than anyone had been ever before. Because writing the book, I got to know some of these guys, They're very ordinary people going to sea, just sailors with families at home. And yet this small number of people, or whatever, it was 120 of them, were the people who at one time had gone, the only ones had ever gone that far south. And I think that would just been a, an amazing moment, especially after what they'd have gone through. And I'd like to have been there. What luxury item would you take on a polar expedition? <sighs> oh, well, I don't know. I'd probably take a very, very nice bottle of grappa. 
crap, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, there we are, you see. Yeah, what a man, man of worst, well, a traveller like you, you've tasted them all. <laughs> when did you feel most in danger during your career of travelling and exploring? Well, there was a number of occasions, usually on light planes in storms. And there was one uh, part of the journey we had to fly from North Greenland to the Svalbard. And we, we weren't really filming at that point. We just, it was just getting, we'd gone off course because we were supposed to land in Svalbard earlier. We couldn't find an airfield, so this, the, we spent the night in North Greenland. And then we flew and it, it, the conditions got worse and worse and the plane began to shake and it's a small plane and you feel every bump of it. And then suddenly we came out of the cloud and the, the roaring, broiling ocean was about 50 feet below us. I mean, it was on those moments where I thought, we're going to hit the water, there's no other way. And it just kept us under, under the cloud, which was actually thick fog. And we got to, we got to Svalbard safely. But, I mean, it was the sort of conditions under which no one would ever normally fly. But when things happen like that, it seems all right when you set out. And it comes where a company gets like that halfway through. You do feel in a terrifying likelihood of not getting anywhere. But I was always very optimistic, always kind of knew somehow that we'd get there. Um, I hate to ask this question because even I think I've asked this one before, so I hate to think how many other people have. Um, where would you still like to go, having been so many places? Where's left? Um, well, for me, there's places like Costa Rica, um, which I'd like to go to just simply because it sounds like kind of, it's a country that's got a very interesting and enlightened policy on, on the, the forest and looking after it and all that. I'd like to see how that all works out. Otherwise, um, Central Asia. I still really haven't been up into the, uh, the mountains um, in the Stans and the Altai Mountains. I'd love to go there where all the great sort of invasions of Europe seem to begin in that land up there in the mountains of Central Asia. Genghis Khan and everybody else. So I'd quite like to go see why they left. <laughs> Who, history fans always love your kind of historically inspired comedy. Uh, what, what other, was there other, did you have ideas for sketches that never quite made it, but you know, around other, other historical episodes? Well, yeah, I mean, we did quite a lot for the life of Brian, um, which wasn't considered to be quite the right spirit to be included. The stuff that was on the cutting room floor was even naughty. No, it wasn't on the cutting room floor. No, it was just ideas when we were writing it. And we hadn't kind of homed in on what the life of Brian was going to be really about, i.e. authoritarian religious movements and all that. So we had scenes like someone, I think Peter, ringing up to try and book a table for the Last Supper and having problems, you know, sort of 12 Thursday night, you must be joking. Um, all right, have a, what you can do, we can do you three tables of four and put them close to each other. No, no, we've got to be on the same table. It was one of these ridiculous things. Oh, we do you all right, we do you Monday night. Um, and then all that. We've all got to be on the same side of the table. No, I can't do that. Health and safety. So that was, uh, that was a little thing that never got made. If I had a pound for every time I've posted, made a programme or put social media about the Romans and building things, and I've had people replying, what the Romans have done for us, I'd be a very wealthy man. Yes. I mean, that's well, thank you. I mean, that's um, that is, I'd that's. I'd be a wealthy man. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, yeah, you <laughs> should be. Wealthy. You came up with it. <laughs> um, no, I can't claim that as pleasing Chapman, but yeah, great thing. Uh, where do you like going in Britain? Where's your favourite historic location in Britain? Well, favourite, um, the most beautiful place in Britain is the, uh, the Western Isles of Scotland. Um, I love going up there, Glencoe. We did a lot of filming. I used to know a wonderful climber there called Hamish McInnes. And then to be able to go from there as a springboard to the islands, um, that, that, that's, that's just magnificent scenery. Uh, if you could be a fly on the wall, you've mentioned you'd like to have been there when they went further south. Is there any other part, any part of history, not just exploration, not just high latitude exploration, that you'd like to have been a fly on the wall for? It would probably be another moment of exploration. I, I would think, you know, the first Westerner to see the Victoria Falls must have been pretty extraordinary. I think it was Livingston, was it? I mean, it probably wasn't Livingston, it was probably some 
guy he said, go and get some water for, the, for breakfast. And he'd gone and said, hey, you wouldn't believe it. I said, what, you find some water? Did I find water? Uh, half a mile of it, 600 feet dro dropping down. So that might have been uh, uh, seeing something like that for the first time. Uh, and what era would you find least, would you least like to visit in history with your time machine? Uh, I can't think of any era I'd, I'd least like to visit. Uh, probably London during the plague wouldn't have been ideal. Good answer. Finally, you'll be glad to hear. Um, what <laughs> is, uh, if you hadn't been comedian, author, broadcaster, national treasurer, what would you have ended up doing? Uh, I've probably been a journalist, actually. That's what I wanted to be. And those days there were lots of breaks as journalists. And I kind of, you know, I thought this is... Uh, it, it combined all the things that I... Well, apart from the acting, I suppose. Certainly the desire to travel and the, the, the love of writing, and particularly writing about foreign places. A foreign correspondent would have suited me fine. Did you always love travel right from the beginning? I wanted to travel, yes. I was always fascinated and curious about the world from when I was very, very young. Um, all the books I read were tempted books, which were set in abroad, especially the Biggles books and uh, Hornblower, the naval stories and all that sort of thing. Any foreign name, because of foreign names and places like the Gobi Desert and um, the Equator and, uh, I don't know, all these sort of the Amazon River itself, you know, just, uh, I knew I'd never see them, so I just, yeah, they grew in my imagination. Has travel, has the meaning of travel changed in your lifetime? When you were young, you thought you'd never see these places. Yeah. Now, people yeah. expect to fly half around the world to a wedding and at the drop of a hat. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of become, it's become mass market, it's become popular. Even, even new generations of people in China traveling all the world, so recently lived out of poverty. What does that, does it mean something different now? Is it less special or is it still magical? I think it can be magical. It depends where you go and how you go. I think what's happened, because we can get to places very easily, what we've done is tend to make them into sort of places we find at home, only with 24 hour sort of sunshine or whatever, you know, I mean, it, it, with better weather. I still think the attraction of remote places on Earth where people haven't been still is an adventure, which is what I always liked about travel, not knowing what was going to happen. Whereas the other side of it is accessibility, which is certainly um, hugely, hugely improved. But accessibility to what? You know, just, just somewhere that would be more comfortable than home. Uh, I always think that, that travel is about a complete change to your existence and your way you look at the world. It's not about comfort. It's, a lot of it's about discomfort. And that's the only way you sort of find things. And people say to me, oh, you've, you've been abroad, you've eaten that terrible food. Well, you know, the, it's not terrible food to the people who cook it. You know, it's actually probably better food than you'll get in a sort of takeaway here and all that. So I think that part, learning a little bit um, from the rest of the world is what it's really all about, rather than saying that, uh, you know, I can just use the rest of the world as a, as a background for, for, for my own sort of... You know, time off. The most depressing sentence in the world is when you go to a hotel and say, what's the Wi-Fi password? Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, great. Lovely.